Welcome, everybody. I'm Dan Fagan, uh, the director of the science writing program here at NYU. And it's a pleasure to welcome my good friend and tennis partner and uh, sometime hey. debating partner, uh, John Horgan, who is a really fascinating guy. And I can't wait to read his book, which I've just bought. And you can buy it, too. Uh, for 1995, right over there, from right. that nice looking young man. So uh, feel free to do that, and if you're nice to John, I bet he'll be willing to sign it. Uh, I'll leave it to Lee Holtz to formally introduce John, but I will just say that in, in science journalism, there are wallflowers and there are strong personalities. <laughs> and we, and uh, John is not a wallflower. Uh, <laughs> John is a person who says what he thinks, and uh, he almost always has uh, good <laughs> empirical backing for what he says. Uh, and he has a way of saying it that attracts attention in the best sense of the word, you know, not just attention for its own sake. So he's a really good model for 21st century uh, in, uh, science journalism, whether he is willing to acknowledge that or not. So I'll uh, turn it over to Lee Holtz, distinguished writer in residence here at the Institute, who as always is our host. Uh, take it away, Professor Holtz. Thank you, Dan. So thank you for joining us. This is um, Inside Out, and uh, the first of our spring speakers, uh, John Horgan, is nice enough to join us this evening. It, it, it constitutes the latest chapter in what I've come to think of is our, is our living anthology um, of the best of American science journalism. And uh, we have a very good lineup this spring. On March 6th, uh, we'll be talking with Alan Schwartz from the New York Times about his remarkable uh, series of investigative stories into the um, brain concussions and sports injuries in professional sports, and in particular, the challenges of uh, writing uh, sophisticated science through the venue of a sports section. Um, then we'll, on uh, uh, March 19th, uh, be talking to author and blogger uh, Annie Murphy-Paul. And on April 4th, we'll be uh, having a sit down with Associated Press science correspondent Seth uh, Borenstein, who's uh, visited with us before. This time, we're going to be talking about that sort of especially delicious experience of conjuring up expertise on uh, deadline, um, how to become knowledgeable on something that 15 minutes ago you had never heard of. Um, but this evening, the idea of these sessions is to talk about science journalism and to talk about it in terms of craft. And we do that by bringing in uh, the best that our business has and uh, walking uh, with them through uh, their work, uh, try to understand how they did what they did, why they make the kinds of choices they do. Um, and uh, John, in particular, stands at the intersection of uh, what in the 20th century, 21st century is, is kind of evolving into this interesting landscape of words and forms and techniques and media technology and all of them in the service of the story of science. Um, so with our changing attention spans and our hard financial realities, uh, the new technologies of narrative are something that you've really taken up. Um, but specifically, what we want to talk with you this evening is like, you know, why do we write? How do we write? Do we write to educate? Do we write to inform? Do we write to entertain? Um, or as in your case, do we write to prod, to provoke, to persuade? Um, John, for those of you who don't know, a uh, long-standing science journalist, and he is currently director of the Center for Science Writings at Stevens Institute of Technology um, across the river in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, he's a former senior staff writer at Scientific American. He's written for the New York Times, uh, for Newsweek, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times. I know these now sort of sound like stations of the cross, you know, <laughs> right. and, um, uh, and the Golgotha of modern journalism. But um, New Republic, Slate, Discover, the London Times. He uh, currently writes a very well-regarded blog for Scientific American. Um, he uh, writes for the Chronicle for Higher Education. Um, he does for the BBC. He is a, a frequent presence on Bloggerheads TV. For those of you who are not familiar, a kind of really interesting ongoing experiment in online media. Um, started up by Mickey Kaus and 
Robert Wright. Robert Wright, yes, yes. okay. Um, but most importantly, he is, uh, for our purposes, um, a distinguished author and uh, provocateur. His uh, books include uh, The End of Science, um, The uh, uh, Undiscovered Mind, um, How the Human Brain Defies Replication, Medication, Explanation. Uh, he's author of a book called Rational Mysticism, Dispatches from the Borders Between Science and Spirituality. And most recently, um, uh, the uh, uh, end of war. And, you know, I, I, I want to ask you now to kind of take us back to your beginning, but, but I want to I start by asking you a, a very uh, fundamental question. It seems to me that as a writer, um, you have evolved quite dramatically over the course of your career um, from, a, from a somewhat conventional, um, gifted, but conventional science journalist into someone who I think can fairly be called a public intellectual of science. And, and this is an unusual thing. There aren't very many of you out there, uh, journalists who come to the table um, as journalists, not as uh, uh, successful scientists with a Nobel Prize under your arm, no, with, with some standing within the field itself. Um, and you have uh, created a space for yourself where you challenge uh, and uh, provoke uh, science, you call their bluff, you um, put matches between their toes and light them. <laughs> Where did this start? How did you come to this business? Take um, us back to the beginning. Well, it depends on how far back you want me to go. Uh, first, I should say that when I read your write-up of me, um, it made me, I, I, I was actually pretty impressed with myself, and I, I think I should, let you know that um, from my perspective, my career has been lots of uh, false starts and sort of fumbling around and trying to figure out what I want to do with my career, uh, experimenting with different forms. Um, I, I came to science journalism very late. I didn't even graduate from college uh, until I was almost 29 years old. I finally, I went to a whole bunch of different schools. I finally uh, finished up at uh, Columbia School of General Studies, which is sort of for misfits and, and uh, older people. Uh, and then I, I went to the um, journalism school. I had been drifting around before that because I had this idea that I would be a fiction writer. Actually. I mean, living in a pup tent. And when we talk about <laughs> drifting, we're talking about serious sort of Neil Cassidy, Jack Kerouac, uh, uh, wannabe. Uh, yeah, which sounds uh, Living more in a pup tent in the Keys, hitchhiking across Kansas, uh, yeah, hanging searching out with, for I don't know what. Yeah, hanging out with petty criminals. It, it, was, um, it was not as exciting, actually, as it, uh, as it might sound in the short form. And eventually I decided, I knew I wanted to write. The question was how I would make a living at it. And uh, so I decided that I really needed to go to college to try to figure that out. And uh, I took a science writing class at Columbia with Pamela McCordick. Do you remember her? Mm -hmm, um, sure. A very accomplished science writer. And she made me feel that uh, science journalism uh, was right for me because I'd always been interested in science since I was a little kid. And she always also had these interesting ideas about, um, and I, pardon me if this sounds kind of pretentious, but taking uh, techniques from fiction and applying them to journalism. And this was in the air because of people like uh, uh, Tom Wolfe and uh, Gaitley, so sort of the science version of new journalism. And so I had that in my head when I went to uh, Columbia. This is in the um, early 80s. I had a wonderful science writing teacher there named Ken Goldstein, uh, who also was a good role model, was very encouraging. At that point, I think I was still, uh, I still had in mind being what I would call a, uh, a celebratory science journalist. A celebratory science journalist, but I have to sort of think, we're, we're now like year 30, 31. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of skated over the first third of your life here. So, uh, that's a long false start, forgive me. I mean, I don't mean that in a, sure. in a mocking sense. But I just wonder, where did you get the idea that at that stage you had any outside chance of staking out a claim to an area that most people who, who practice it, who participate in it, have spent that first third 
taking courses, working on a master's, uh, cobbling up a PhD dissertation. I mean, fortunately, I didn't think of it in those terms. I never would have, uh, I never would have tried to get a job. I, I think the the key for me was getting into Columbia Journalism School, and I think I was lucky to get in, and I loved it. It was interesting to me. I was I was there at a year when there was a lot of discontent. There were some students who knew more than the professors. And they thought it was a waste of time and money. Mm -hmm. For them, it probably was. Was that a formative experience for you, it knowing was, more uh, than the professor? You know, like I said, as you yeah. said, I'd been living in a pup tent uh, in Florida, uh, you know, which is great, but it wasn't really preparing me for uh, journalism. I was a house painter in Denver for five years. I started taking courses at uh, community colleges there. Um, when, when I was graduating from, for, from Columbia, I actually applied to, I think, 50 different publications. And I wanted just to get a job. I, you know, I wasn't picky at all. I got two job offers. I got a job as a clerk, a job offer to be a clerk at the New York Times, mm -hmm. which would mean I envisioned, envisioned it as getting coffee for the real ro uh, reporters and uh, editors and people like that. The other offer was from a magazine that I hadn't even heard of before called IEEE Spectrum, sure. a magazine for uh, engineers. And here I was, um, an English major, and I'm writing about a subject that I know absolutely So nothing. you went to IEEE Spectrum. So I did go there. And, and I was a very well regarded uh, publication. Yeah, yeah, but still it's, you know, it's essentially a glorified uh, trade journal. I mean, it, it, absolutely. It, it's become much more than that. But at this point, it was still quite obscure. And uh, fortunately, I was there when there was an editor who was, had great ambitions for Spectrum, and he was giving us um, really wonderful uh, assignments. I, one of the first things that I wrote about was a uh, Korean airliner that had been shot down by the Russians. This is in the middle of the, um, of the Cold War. This is 1983. And I was asked to write a piece about what US intelligence knew about this uh, incident. I don't know, probably this most of you. This was KAL 007. Yeah. And so I had enormous responsibility very quickly writing about stories uh, with uh, real consequence. Uh, so that was a very good thing. There was one incident that just occurred to me um, that I think was you know, formative, if you want to put it that way. I did a story, I also was covering biomedical engineering. I did a story about a guy named Jerry Petrovsky, who was an engineer at Wright State University, who was wiring up paralyzed people so that they could walk. It was, it was a computer-controlled device that would animate the muscles. I don't know if you remember. Mm -hmm, uh, this guy sure. was, he became a celebrity. He was on 60 Minutes twice. And because it, it seemed as though he had come up with uh, a way to restore uh, motion to people who were quadriplegics or paraplegics, it was, it was amazing. And I interviewed him, I think, uh, just by phone. And I wrote a piece basically saying how fabulous this research was. And uh, because I thought it was. And then I got a letter from somebody saying, this guy is a fraud. He's a big phony. And you're a disgrace for having written this puff piece, basically a piece of advertising about him. And I was so stung by that that I sort of started, uh, you know, I, I had thought, listen, if it's good enough for 60 Minutes, why shouldn't it be good enough for me? I started digging into this guy's career, and I found that his, uh, some of his research subjects had suffered horrible accidents. Their, their bones had shattered because he, he uh, jolted them with too much uh, electricity, and he had covered all that up. He had uh, presented uh, movies of animals that he supposedly had uh, restored motion to after he had artificially uh, paralyzed them. And uh, those videos were phony. They were uh, completely uh, misleading people. And so I ended up writing this big investigative piece for actually not even IEEE Spectrum, the magazine, for this little rag that was distributed to um, engineers. It was normally just about sort of, you know, activities and local chapters of this engineering society. And I wrote this gigantic investigative piece um, about how this guy was a bad person. He was doing bad pseudoscience. And uh, it almost got me fired. There was a big investigation in the society because this guy I had been writing about was very powerful. And, um, and he came after me. The whole university came after me because he was their star. And they tried to destroy me. And the investigation confirmed everything that I had found. And so I sort of went, I mean, it was a huge jolt of uh, adrenaline. And uh, I, that's when I began, I, you know, in, uh, only in retrospect, because mm -hmm. I've, I've been thinking about this because I knew I was going to appear here. That's when I began to think, 
that maybe I could, I could uh, serve a function by challenging um, some, of the, uh, some of the scientific claims that, uh, that are out there and that other journalists are, are touting, and maybe there's another side of it that's, uh, that's not so positive. Well, that's very interesting what you're saying, and I hadn't heard that, that story of that, of that piece. Because you're right, I mean, I think as science writers, as science journalists, we often come to the game as, uh, oh, I don't know, like cupbearers at a communion service. I mean, it's celebratory. Yeah. Um, and there also is this etiquette uh, as well. You're invited into their lab, they share their expertise with you, they look over your shoulder and guide your hand and help you with your mistakes. You, of course, the English major, yeah? <laughs> right. The English major. Um, uh, who's never taken a statistics course or doesn't know um, uh, exactly why water boils. Um, <laughs> but you're impertinent. <laughs> you know, you're raining on the parade. I now, so this did, did, I, I want to just linger on this for sure. a second. So you did this nice, lovely, well-received celebratory story, and then you got this rude letter from a reader. Who was this reader? I don't even know. I don't even. I think it might have been anonymous. Uh -huh. uh, but there was enough detail in it that it made me think, Jesus, I, maybe I really did completely miss this story. Um, so, because you get letters, you don't just throw them in the trash. Uh, well, some, yeah, obviously. Um, I think you know this process. It wasn't as instantaneous as I, I, I made it sound just by telling that story. I, you know, there are lots of times because you know I have, I have no formal training in science, although I did I take I took. Uh, I did take plenty of uh, science courses just as uh, electives in, in uh, college. Um, but then uh, what I realized is that when I'm, I'm covering a story is that even if I did know something about the scientific background, usually it, it really wasn't helpful in understanding some new theory or, or piece of research. And I, and I was quite cowed in the beginning mm -hmm. by, uh, by some scientists. And I, eventually I realized that some scientists try to use that they, they try to dominate you as a journalist and they're trying to point your story in one particular direction. And it took me a while to have the, you know, the balls basically to start wondering if they were uh, giving things to me straight. Now, of course, some of them were. Um, and uh, you know, I would end up writing positive stories about them. But I, I actually, after a while, began deliberately seeking out stories where I thought there might be a disconnect between the received wisdom and uh, what was going on. Um, but even when I, so I, I went from Spectrum to Scientific American, Spectrum I'd been covering mainly technology, also a lot of national security stories, which, which uh, I loved. And, and I've, I've tried to cover those kinds of stories throughout my career. And I went to Scientific American, all of a sudden I'm writing about particle physics and, and uh, cosmology and molecular biology and things like that. So again, I, I you know, it sort of took me a while to ramp up to the point where I would be talking to a string theorist and uh, he would be saying something to, and I would go, wait a minute, that, that can't be right. Or, or I, would, I would feel it was my job really to challenge some of the things uh, that they were telling me instead of trying to report it and put it in the kind of metaphorical language that makes people think that they're understanding what's going on. Actually, one important uh, realization for me was that sometimes if you're listening to a science, scientist and he or she is telling you something that makes absolutely no sense, uh, early on in my career I would think, it's because I'm too stupid and, I, and ignorant. That's the problem here. Eventually I realized that often it's the problem with the scientist, that maybe the science really is kind of muddled or the scientist doesn't understand it that well, or they're just not working hard enough to make it comprehensible, and that's on them. And so the challenge would be to try to make it comprehensible, and if it's not still, then to point that out to them and, and try to find the soft spots. So at Scientific America, did you have a particular uh, beat, a particular field? You said you did a lot of national security stories, but. I have this feeling that in your years at Scientific American, you started to build a kind of portfolio uh, of interviews, of, of skeptical responses, if you like, um, that then sort of led to, to some of your later work. So I'd, I'm curious, to, My, how I did, had that, the, did that work? I had the best job in the world. I, and I see there's, there are a couple of colleagues from Scientific American here. Phil Yam, uh, we, yeah. we overlapped in- um, Is he lying? In the 90s. <laughs> 
<laughs> He'll tell you later. Um, it was just, I, it was the coolest job in the world. Actually, when I arrived at Scientific American in 1986, uh, the people, the editors there were really editors. They, there was very little staff written material. The job was basically to take articles by scientists and make them readable. There was a news section where there would be short uh, items written by the staff. They weren't even signed. I was the first person hired to be a full-time staff writer. It was like, I was so lucky to get this job. And I started doing news stories, but then eventually they started having these big feature articles um, by staff writers. I was the first person to do that. I did one on, on uh, you know, where the universe came from, the origin of life, uh, uh, behavioral genetics, the nature-nurture debate, the degree to which um, we can possibly manipulate genes to, to improve ourselves, all these sorts of things. And my editor was great because he basically kept, I think I might have had a beat, maybe it would have been national security and physics, something like that. He kept kicking me out of my comfort zone. And, um, and there were some times when I really was pissed off at him, he'd be, I remember this is Jonathan Peel, uh, he mm -hmm. forced me to do an article on mathematics. And uh, I, I just thought it was going to be a nightmare. And it ended up being one of, the, one of my favorite articles. I really enjoyed it a lot. I wrote sort of about the philosophy of mathematics and how m math is becoming uh, increasingly postmodern. I still have people who are stalking me, basically, for that article. It was called uh, The Death of uh, Proof. The Death of Proof. I was going to ask you about The Death of Proof. The Death of As Proof. As best I can tell, that was the first piece that you did that genuinely pissed off every scientist that you dealt with I and still uh, appears to in the mathematics community resonate to this day. Who is this person <laughs> and how dare they? My Wikipedia, I have a Wikipedia yeah. page that was actually created as far did, as did I can tell. Did you write your own Wikipedia page? But, no, I didn't. It okay. was created by a guy named David Hoffman who was one of these people who, I, he was a source for the article and then he thought it was atrocious and and, uh, and so he's been my personal stalker ever since, which is very flattering, actually. I believe that he wrote a review for the Not Notes, Notes of the American yes. uh, Mathematical Society, whatever right. they call themselves, um, of this book, right. which is one of the most sort of like hardworking, scathing reviews I've ever read. Yeah, it is. Um, he's, he's in fact, I happen to have it right here. <laughs> it's and it's called The End of Science, Facing the Limits of Knowledge in the Twilight of the Scientific Age, the name of the book reviewed by David Hoffman, and in it, Mr. Hoffman, Dr. Hoffman, Professor Hoffman. Yeah, he's, he's a good mathematician, um, actually. Just kind no, of I'm sure he is. Um, uh, he says, this is, a, uh, Mr. Horgan essentially d uh, displays, quote, um, a clear antipathy toward mathematical thinking and a fundamental misunderstanding of the uses of mathematics and science. Books like this, excuse me, I hold this up. Books like this cloud public understanding of what we do to our detriment. <laughs> and the hour in that sentence, I think clearly to, to me, and it resonates that the scientists are our and you are them. Yeah. You are one of them. Right. Who do you think is them in this case? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I should say are that... Are you the unwashed? What is this? Um, I, you know, the end of science, I became more and more of a critical science journalist over time. And, How did uh, that happen? I want to you know, not to get ahead of yourself. So there you are at Scientific American, having great fun at the smorgasbord of science, of writing a feature on this and a feature on that, and you're coming from Scientific American, so I'm sure they're all glad to see you. <laughs> um, it's true. And yet you are apparently developing a somewhat critical uh, mindset here. And um, it wasn't only, it, it was sort of, critical of some of the science being done. But then I, uh, sometime in the late 80s, I started a new feature for Scientific American, a profile feature, mm -hmm. that ended up being so much fun for me. And again, my editor just said, go ahead and do what you want. I didn't have to find news pegs. I just thought, who would be a really cool person to sit down and, with and talk to for a few hours? And, and I came up with uh, people like uh, even philosophers of science. I thought, is, is Thomas Kuhn still alive? Hmm. I, and he was. So I tracked him down, and uh, Thomas Kuhn sat with me for four hours up at MIT and talked to me about uh, you know, whether scientific truth is possible. I tracked down Karl Popper, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, Ed Witten, the superstring theorist. I had a bizarre 
um, interview with him. How do you prepare for an interview like that? Um, I How do you prepare for an interview with a giant of science and you, you ignorant fool? Yeah, I, I, do do? Um, I over prepare. Uh -huh. uh, so I would, in the case of Ed Witten, it was tough because you know, he hasn't written popular books the way, say, Stephen uh, Weinberg or mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking have. He's written, I mean, all his papers are, are about string theory and they're gibberish to somebody like me. Um, but I've read things that other people have written about him. And then I talked to a whole bunch of uh, different particle physicists and said, tell me about Ed Witten, about his place in uh, the pantheon of great physicists and um, in the history of physics and so forth. And so I got a sense of what he was like and, and his personality and, um, and his role as a, a scientist. And um, what was great about these profiles is that also I wanted to get a sense of their personal growth, where their ideas had come from. What I remember about Ed Witten, and by the way, Ed Witten, how many of you have heard of Ed Witten? He, so okay, yeah, about like forty percent. So tell us who Ed he, Witten is. He's a um, he's somebody. He didn't create string theory. String theory is this uh, candidate for a unified theory of physics that can explain everything. It's sometimes called a, a theory of everything. Um, Witten started started doing papers on it in the early '80s. He literally has one of the biggest heads I've ever seen. He's, his his head is like it's like a normal head, and then add about four inches uh, to the top of it. Of, just brain, I guess. He is considered by some physicists to be, I've been told, he has maybe the greatest pure math physics mind mm. in history, greater than Einstein, greater than um, Newton. And he, he's, you know, people talk about him like he is a, uh, a god. And, uh, but I, I was primed to talk to him when I went, uh, and, for, and he didn't want to talk to me either. He's very self-effacing. A uh, very shy person, which made me, of course, just want to interview him all the more. Um, and but you know, so this brilliant person. And what I wanted to talk to him about is the is the problems with string theory that it, they can't it can't be tested. Right. And this is something that I just kind of you know bore in on. It's something that an English major can grab onto and trying to approach uh, string theory. And so um, he finally agreed to the interview. And um, at, but after saying only one hour and uh, you know having all these kind of conditions and telling me he really didn't want to do it, and he had asked for me to send him all this stuff in advance, and I actually and I sent him a, a piece that I'd written about Thomas Kuhn, you know the philosopher. Oh, he wanted to see articles of yours. Yeah. Okay. And so I got down there and I would just walk in his door and I'm saying hi, you know, pleasantries, and he starts ranting at me about how irresponsible I am for having written um, a piece about Thomas Kuhn, about this skeptical philosopher. And uh, Witten started lecturing me ha on how there is the truth, and scientists discover the truth. And how dare you write about this philosophy that suggests that uh, scientific truth is in some sense um, unattainable. And so by this time, I turned on my tape recorder. And, um, and so we had this back and forth. I started defending myself as a journalist. I said, I said it's my job to also to entertain people and to provoke them and to raise questions about what some people like you think uh, is the truth. That's, I, I do all, all that stuff too. And he said, your job is not to provoke people. Uh, if you're a responsible journalist, you should be communicating the scientific truth, which was just wonderful. It's like, you know, now we're into philosophy of science and, and he's defending himself from the point of view of a, I don't know, a naive uh, realist. So what was great about the profile is I put all that in the profile. I put all this interaction between uh, the two of us, which I just thought, you know, in some ways I guess it's, it's, you know, narcissistic on my part, and certainly there were some readers who hated that, but uh, my intention was to sort of provide a richer context for, um, for some of the science by showing the personality of this, this mad genius uh, and how that might intersect with some of the things that he's telling the public out there and you, uh, some of the things that he's telling other physicists. Do you think it's your job to communicate the science? Uh, yeah. Or do you think it's your job to communicate something else? I think it's my job. I mean, I care about what the truth is. I'm not a postmodernist at all. Um, I guess I gravitate toward subjects. I, 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 at some point, I decided that the last thing I wanted to do as a journalist w was preach to the converted, sort of 
you know, repackage material in an entertaining way, but not in a way that actually um, disturbed people or provoked them uh, in a significant way. I, I'm looking, as I said before, for areas where public perceptions, um, there's a gap between them and what I think is the reality as I'm learning it. And I did feel that, and I've come to feel more and more over time that it is my responsibility to do that. Also, I just like it, it's fun. <laughs> so there you are at Scientific American, you have this great job, you have a license to just pursue your curiosity, you have a great calling card on these great minds to make a claim on their time when they should be out discovering the scientific truth and instead they're arguing with you. Um, is it something, of, I'm just trying to understand here because it does seem to me that based in the evolution of John Horgan, um, that something happened with you in this phase where you acquired the idea that science needed a critic and that it ought to be you. Um, you know, there are other journalists who do this as well. Uh, it, it, it wasn't quite that grandiose. I mean, I wasn't sort of seeing myself as, as um, you know, the personal uh, savior of, uh, of science or somehow, you know, this crusader. Um, I was doing what I enjoyed doing, but I, I did feel that it was important. Um, and, you know, there is a kind of moral component to that that's become stronger over time. Um, the, the older I get, the more, and this might be as a consequence of being a father, um, I've begun to get away from stories like particle physics or uh, fields like particle physics and cosmology, which has just gotten so crazy. Come on, Phil, I mean, multiverse theory and uh, M theory and all that kind of stuff. It's just total, you know, science fiction with mathematics now. It has nothing to do with reality. The idea that there are tenured big time professors at Ivy League schools talking about uh, parallel universes to me is really a travesty. So I've, I've gravitated more and more toward the kind of science that actually affects people's lives and especially toward uh, science that, um, scientific claims that I think really can have negative consequences and, and directly impact people's lives. Um, and you know that's one of the reasons why I wrote right. this book. But I was doing that at Scientific American as well mm -hmm. before we were talking about an article I did on um, behavioral genetics. Yes, on eugenics. Because right. I, you know, I sort of saw this pattern that I thought was emerging in genetics research to ascribe virtually everything that we are and do to specific genes. That's what behavioral genetics uh, does. And then there's this sort of parallel field, evolutionary psychology, that also was coming up with what I felt were, in some cases, really deterministic theories of uh, human behavior, including uh, war and other forms of violence. And um, my reading of the scientific literature led me to think that a lot of that was just bullshit. It was really bad science. And, uh, and so I, um, in that case, I think I have become a little bit of a crusader, because I think it's, it's uh, it's pernicious, that, that whole area of genetic determinism, because it's, it's sort of limiting what we think we can, uh, we can be. So, so John, would yeah, you do a piece? I, I want to just say, excuse me, Dan, I, I, oh. I felt uh, I should say that this is a conversation and, and not a lecture, and, and, and please um, interrupt with questions and digressions. And uh, uh, if we start to bore you, change the subject. And, and Dan has got a microphone. and, uh, and uh, and use it, please. Yeah, and he's not afraid to use it. So, Dan, thank you. I mean, John, the thing about your your journalism that is that is wonderful, but also frustrating uh, sometimes, it is that you you stake out a position and you you defend it, you know, aggressively, uh, and. You know the way that some of us were were sort of trained to do our journalism as well. You know, yeah, there's this, but then there's also that, and and uh, both kinds of of writing are really useful, but they do different things. You That's know, true. And, and so I guess the one of the things I always wanted to ask you in public, I think maybe we talk about it in private, is. 
you know, to, to what extent does your work require just sort of pretending that you don't have doubts that you actually have, you know? Uh, oh, that, you that's know, tough. You know, in, in, in order to do the kind of work that you do, do you have to, you know, do, do, you, do you have to, to some extent, you know, lie to yourself sometimes? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no. Um, I, well, let me t uh, give you an example of something I just, that I have can I doubts. Just, can I just make sure I understand the question? Do you mean lie to yourself in the sense of pretending to have a certainty about your conclusion that in fact you don't have? I mean, to sort of over claim, yeah. to over claim. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I actually think it's really, purity, for the sake it's of really relevant to this group too. Yeah. We have yeah. a lot of yeah. young reporters who were thinking, gosh, you know, I'd like to do that too, except I just, I'm not sure that I'm right because I, I, I see contrasting evidence and I say, well, you know, they've got a point. Uh, yeah. uh, and yet here's this guy who is, he's just so sure, you know? There are some things that I don't write about because I, see, I like, I, I think um, indignation is sort of good fuel for me. And there are some topics that I haven't written about all that much that uh, you, for example, have written about that um, I don't have really strong opinions. Global warming, for example, I'm a little bit ambivalent about global warming. When I read uh, the, um, you know, I accept global, human-induced uh, global warming, but some of the sort of strong uh, cases being made for catastrophic global warming make me very uncomfortable. And I just flat out, I don't believe them or I have real doubts about them. And I also worry about the rhetorical strategy of scaring the hell out of people as a way to bring about uh, political change. In fact, in, in uh, my new book, I go after Bill McKibben of all people. I mm -hmm. mean, he's like yeah. the saint, but it bothers me that he's saying that, um, you know, he thinks civilization is about to collapse and we need to go back to living like Neolithic tribal people uh, to solve this problem, which I think is, is, uh, is crazy. So it's more a matter of gravitating toward the topics that I really do feel I know a lot about and can say things with a lot of certainty than, um, than sort of manufacturing the certainty in myself and having a lot of confirmation bias. Although from the outside, I'm sure it does, it does look like confirmation bias. Well, this, but Dan's raising a point that, I, that I really I think is central to our discussion here, which is one of the things that characterizes your uh, published uh, uh, book uh, uh, collection is um, each one uh, packages an idea. Now, I don't, and I'd be interested in knowing, like, which comes first. I mean, it's, it may well be that, uh, and in fact, I, I know it is for the case for the end of science, um, which is, I guess, where this starts, uh, that there's an enormous amount of work that goes up beforehand, uh, which then leads you to a conclusion Right. And then you backtrack, and as a matter of packaging and writing and whatever, you tie it up with this just wonderfully provocative red ribbon. Because surely the best marketing device is to start an argument. Right. Um, no, seriously. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be your tactic. So mm -hmm. you have mastered what I like to think of as the, uh, as the uh, uh, culture of no. It's like, no, science will never uh, solve all the great mysteries. No, science will never figure out your mind. That's the undiscovered brain. No uh, rational mysticism, spirituality will do nothing to relieve the dark corner of existence. That's your next book. And then now we you know we have uh, no war is not necessary. Yeah, but this one is positive. Uh, if Come you're on, a, the end of if, war. That's what could be more. Uh, are you kidding? I work for the Wall Street Journal. If there's an end of war, what happens to the defense industry? You know, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What but, an admission. But but uh, 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 I say that as a spectator. Yeah. Um, uh, and an observer of markets. Um, but you stake out a contrarian claim, is my point. Yeah. You have, you have perfected the art of the sweeping contrarian claim. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess I have. If, or take if, a, disagree, take a contrarian well, you know, response. There are, there are points in all my books where I, I, I admit that I, I have doubts, actually, um, because I. You know, I try to be as honest as I can, uh, certainly in, in this book and in The End of Science, where I wonder if I'm crazy and, uh, I mean, at, at 
the, the end of science, I even admit that um, part of my thinking was inspired by a psychedelic drug trip that I had mm -hmm. um, you know, back in the uh, early 80s. Uh, so um, actually bringing up doubt is, is part of the, the uh, fun of it. I should say though, I still admire what I call classic, I don't know, celebratory journalism. I'm a huge fan of Natalie Angier, for example, um, who I, is one of the best explainers. You know, she's got just uh, abundant lyrical gifts and can make even chemistry really sexy and exciting. And I, I you know, I wish I could write uh, like that. I'm more attracted to uh, areas of science that do have a lot of controversy because I think that creates a, a natural uh, narrative and a, and a, and a drama. Um, and it, you know, as I said, it just suits me. Yeah, but I have to say, you're selling yourself short as a writer. Um, and I know you'll argue with me about that. But, <laughs> but and one of the things I think is interesting and I'd like to ask you about is, is how your writing has evolved. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, in the end of science, uh, I'll, I'll just use uh, two examples. Um, these incredible little thumbnails of, uh, of uh, researchers that you encounter, uh, in this case here on uh, page 116, Richard Dawkins. I mean, uh, if anyone, Richard Dawkins, of course, the, the author of the selfish gene idea and a great uh, debater uh, in the sort of uh, take no prisoners Cambridge debating union style. Um, I met uh, Dawkins at a gathering convened by his literary agent in Manhattan. He is an icily handsome man with predatory eyes, a knife thin nose, and incongruously rosy cheeks. He wore what appeared to be an expensive custom made suit. And when he held out his finely veined hands to make a point, they quivered slightly. It was the tremor, not of a nervous man, but of a finely tuned high performance competitor in the war of ideas, Darwin's Greyhound. <laughs> now, that's not a fluke, because I'll give you another one. <laughs> In August 1992, he's talking about uh, um, uh, David Bohm, uh, uh, prominent uh, physicist philosopher, if you like. And tortured soul. And tortured soul. In August 1992, I visited Bohm at his home in Edgware, a suburb north of London. His skin was alarmingly pale especially in contrast to his purplish lips and dark, wiry hair. His frame, sinking into a large armchair, seemed limp and languorous, but at the same time suffused with nervous energy. He cupped one hand over the top of his head, the other rested on the armrest. His fingers, long and blue-veined, with tapered yellow nails, were splayed. He was recovering, he told me, from a recent heart attack. I mean, each one of those is one paragraph, and each one of those packs like more observations uh, about uh, uh, character, uh, physiognomy, and uh, uh, physical detail than like uh, almost any other uh, science writer I can think of right now actually works. And what's also interesting about those two paragraphs is that I happen to know that they pissed the scientists involved off so much, really wounded their vanity in a very high order. Um, uh, and it, one of your many talents for irritating the scientific community actually is displayed by this one quite wonderful detailed classical writing, which over the course of your career you've abandoned as a stylistic thing. And I'm curious, I don't mean that rudely, but your writing has changed. And the writing here, mm -hmm. um, which is very much rooted in reporting, is very different than the writing here which is very much rooted in um, debate and, uh, and teaching. It's and I want to know about how that reflects your mindset and why you did that. So I said that I wanted to be a fiction writer. I think you can see that on display in the end of science. I, uh, I am uh, just trying to sh sort of show off my writing chops. I, you know, I, there are a bunch of you who want to be science journalists, a few, anybody? Yeah, you've got some- I want to be a science journalist. So. I wanted to make sure I said to you, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, stressful time in journalism as a whole, but especially in uh, science journalism. But um, you know, apart from the stuff we've been uh, talking about here, science journalism is just the best job in the world. It's so much fun. 
And I feel as though the form can be anything you want it to be. I mean, you can do literary science journalism, you can do polemical science journalism, celebratory, as I, I said before. I mean, anything that you imagine you can do with it. And, and the great thing about science is that it, it, um, it intersects with pretty much everything else that's going on in the world. Uh, you know, it, I think science journalism used to be kind of defined in a sort of narrow way. I think now there's so many different practitioners with such different styles. Obviously, the sky is the limit. Um, you get to meet the smartest people on the planet. I mean, I was lucky to be practicing science journalism at a big time magazine like Scientific American that could afford to send me around the world to talk to basically anyone I uh, wanted to. Um, I even took a, I had a junket to the South Pole. I mean, how cool is that? You get to, you can, you go to these amazing places, you meet amazing people, you're right on the frontier of knowledge. And um, I think you should feel qualified if you get, if you're, you have the privilege of being part of this profession of um, developing your own judgments and opinions and, and telling people out there in the world uh, what you think is going on. Um, I've just become, you know, in terms of the, some of the, the really um, personal descriptions of people in the end of science, uh, a lot of people hated it. And uh, so I actually deliberately tried to really? scale it back in uh, my later books uh, actually, my third book, Rational Mysticism, went back to that because I was talking to people who were supposedly spiritual experts, and I thought that if you say that you uh, know something about spirituality, then I think your personality is fair game, more so than if you're a physicist or an evolutionary biologist. Um, but in general, I mean, so for example, for the end of war, I thought, Am I going to have little sort of potted descriptions of different people with different theories about war? It just seemed like that would almost be triv trivializing the, the, uh, sub the subject. So that's one reason why I've, I have actually gotten away from that. And, I, I, and to be honest, I enjoyed it. It makes me miss that kind of writing when you read the, those uh, passages. Well, I, I have to say, I've never been able to think of Dawkins as anything except Darwin's greyhound ever <laughs> since. Um, but it, it did make me wonder, I, had, I hadn't really uh, focused on it until I was preparing for this, um, that it perhaps also reflected a, 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 a change in evolution in your thinking about what you were up to and what you were seeking to do. Right. Um, and maybe we can now turn to the, your newest book, um, which as you sort of said earlier, well, this one's optimistic. Um, where did this come from? Um, I, I was eligible for the draft during the Vietnam War. So, you know, um, war was a very personal issue to me from a very early age. Um, I, I think we're about the same age. So I grew up when there was a possibility of nuclear missiles raining from the sky at any moment and destroying sure. You know, according to some scenarios, not just civilization, but all of life on Earth, and and uh, so I've been thinking about this insane behavior of humans since I was a little kid. I covered national security stories that, as I said, through my career. I just remembered that when I was at Columbia Journalism School, um, my th master's thesis was on the nuclear freeze movement. Mm, okay. Uh, so um, you know, it actually goes way back. And, uh, and I, when, I, when I was at Scientific American, I not only was covering Star Wars and um, uh, verification technologies for verifying- uh, Star Wars, the strategic defense initiative, not the movie. Yeah, that's right. Uh, th these were you know, satellites in the sky, among other things, that were supposed to shoot down Soviet missiles when they were really far out, uh, wonderful stuff. Um, I also started writing about the anthropology of war. Where, you know, where did war come from? Mm -hmm. Why do humans fight? Mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, something innate or is it resource competition and those sorts of things? And the reason I decided that I needed to write this book was because I gave a talk, um, and I described this in the book, uh, right after the invasion of Iraq at a local church. And I, my, this priest friend of mine well, just asked me to you know, talk a little bit about the um, uh, what science knows about warfare. And uh, I sort of reviewed some of the stuff about the anthropology of war and so forth. And I, you know, I tried to present 
some of the disturbing findings, but also in an optimistic context. And I, I had some finale like, um, well, if the capacity for war is in our genes, so is the capacity for peace. And the only question is, it's not when we will end war, but or not um, whether we will end war, but when. And so, you know, and I looked out at the audience and everybody was looking at me like, what are you, nuts? And uh, so then I surveyed everybody. And I said, how many of you think that war will end someday? Because, you know, that, that's something that I believe. And, uh, and virtually nobody raised their hands. And these are good, like, green uh, Volvo Prius driving uh, dovish liberals. So I was really surprised. I, I just thought that, that being optimistic about getting rid of war was part of that kind of uh, political outlook. And I realized that uh, after this that it wasn't an anomaly. I've, I've interviewed, uh, I've surveyed thousands of people now on whether they uh, uh, think war will end, including most of my science journalist friends. Virtually all of them say basically, you know, again, are you nuts? No, of course not. War is just something that humans do and always will do. And, um, and some people would cite things like, well, have you heard of this tribe called the Yanomamo? They fight like crazy and even for no apparent reason in the uh, Amazon. Or have you heard of those chimps? They're all killing each other. And you know, we descended from them. So well, that's why we kill each other. All this really bad science being invoked to defend, defend um, this idea that war is uh, Did you know it was bad science? in advance of your getting interested in it as a book topic? Actually, um, not. I started doing a lot of research. Initially, I believed some of the stuff about war going all the way back to the common ancestor with chimpanzees. This mm -hmm. comes from a guy named Richard Wrangham uh, at Harvard. And, um, and so I was going to say, basically, even if war is an eight, we can still end it as we've ended a lot of other uh, behaviors that seem to have a strong biological basis. But then the more I started looking into the topic, the more I realized that, that a lot of those claims about chimpanzee um, raiding and uh, about some of these hunter-gatherer tribes and other very simple societies that supposedly engaged in ruthless warfare were false. Okay, so let's unpack this for a second. So you say, when I began looking into it. Well, okay, when you were working on the end of science and gathering string for that, you know, you were John Horgan working for Scientific American, everybody was happy to see you. But now, you know, when you start digging into, looking into the research that underpins um, our ideas about the anthropology or the genetics of war, uh, now you're John, you're John Horgan who wrote this book that pissed off all my colleagues, and I know when you come through the door, whatever I'm doing, you're gonna debunk it. So how do you look into it now? What's, what's your process? What do you do? I you know, it's been amazing to me, actually, that I'm not turned down for interviews uh, more often than I am. I, occasionally I am. Um, but most scientists, I think, if they know who I am, and certainly a lot of them don't, they are even more eager to talk to me um, because uh, they know that I really sort of want to tangle and, and get into the details of the research. And I think they, if, if they think I'm going to disagree with them, they see that as a challenge and they want to persuade me of their point of view. So I actually had some great interviews. I, I talked to this guy, Richard Wrangham, at great length. I even interviewed him for Blogging Heads TV. I talked to Steve Pinker, who was also writing a book on warfare uh, for a really long time. And we also you know, I met in person and had email exchanges and so forth. Um, so the research really wasn't all that different for this book than it had been for, uh, for my early, earlier books. I still had pretty much all the access that I wanted. We have a question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is kind of a specific question, but you were talking about how when you were first starting looking into this book, you found that most people don't think that war will end. Can you talk about the choice for your cover in reference to that <laughs> thought? <laughs> Do you, you, you don't like it? No, I do like oh, it, but oh. I think it, it, was it a conscious choice to play into the fact that people are more attracted to the idea of war than the end of war? Um, well, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. well, you mean because it's war and, and you yeah. can barely right. see the end? Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so yeah. first of all, I should say that I, it was really hard for me to get this book published. Uh, I probably shouldn't admit this, but it was uh, my, uh, my agent, former mm -hmm. agent now, um, <laughs> always thought it was a stupid idea. He thought it was sentimental, um, naive, hippie hogwash. And he, he said, you know, if you, you, 
your reputation is as a tough guy. You're going to seem soft uh, by writing a book like The End of War. Bad idea. Um, he still tried to sell it for me, but he didn't succeed. And, um, and I, think it, I, I think his heart uh, wasn't in it. Um, this is published by McSweeney's, which is, uh, if any of you have heard of Dave Eggers, he's this mm -hmm. really sort of mm -hmm. groovy guy. He's almost like the classic um, 60s hippie intellectual idealist, real, you know, just a really wonderful person, except he's only in about 40 years old. And, um, and he created this little publishing house. And uh, I met him um, uh, a couple of years ago, I guess it was, and uh, told him that, you know, about my obsession with war. And um, he said that that was something that he'd be interested in publishing. And so that's how I ended up with him. And I bring this up because McSweeney's is known for its graphics. I had nothing to do with this. I just saw it when it was already a done deal. Okay. Uh, and that's what they came up with. And I got to say, I, I think it's kind of groovy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. more attractive. Right. It's, I think it's, you know, basically they want to grab your attention, uh, first of all, with a big bold type on red. And then, yeah, then you go, the, oh, the end of war. OK. I don't, I don't know. I know some people who don't like it, but I'm just so thrilled that the damn thing is out. Yeah, actually, I think it's very cool. I think it's yeah. very cool. good. Yeah. So how do you place a book your agent doesn't like? Um, I didn't use an agent. I. Uh, when after I met Eggers, we just worked out a contract on um, on our own. Okay, I'm sorry because I thought you had just said a minute ago that well, you sort of said well, he used to be my agent, and well, he didn't like this idea because you're yeah. a tough guy. I mean, what's that? How does that relationship work for you? I with, mean, with a book or agent. used to work with well, with an agent nurturing a succession of of, of uh, subject books. Uh, my uh, my agent sold the books for me, but he had nothing to do with the. Um, with uh, the production of the books, with uh, the ideas in them, I would sort of come to him and and say, "This is what I'm thinking of doing." And he'd go, "Well, okay, I can. I think I can sell that." And he'd go out and and uh, sell it for me. So, um, I, you know, there's some agents. This is a guy named John Brockman, who I actually really like a lot, even though our personalities are very uh, different. Um, but I would, you know, uh, you know, I still have fond uh, memories of him, even though we're, we don't work uh, together anymore. But he's the kind of agent, I think, more who, um, you come to him when you're sort of already arrived, and then he'll get you more money. My first book, The End of Science, was sold by uh, a, different, um, a different agent. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Brockman after that book mm -hmm. came out. Mm -hmm. No loyalty, huh? You just, uh, no, actually, well, I just didn't want to get the, <laughs> my first agent I liked, but then he signed my now ex-wife uh, to write uh, a book uh -huh. and he displeased her and it became a him or me kind of thing. Ah, uh, so. I see. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> right. that's a clean, it's a clean choice, yeah. yeah. I was, um, I guess on a different note, I was wondering more generally um, whether you would draw a line between an essayist and a journalist. Hmm. And whether that would be a matter of rhetoric or style or responsibility or whether you'd make that distinction at all. Great question. Uh, yeah, it, it is. Um, I think some of, uh, I, I think really good journalism sort of transcends those categories. So you can have a journalistic essay. I, I, I can't think immediately of somebody um, who would embody that. I don't know, maybe you guys can. But I think classic examples you'd find in the New York. You know, so what distinguishes a piece in uh, the New Yorker from, um, I don't know, Scientific American or uh, even something in the science section of the Times, although those, although those can get essay-ish. Uh, the, the pieces in The New Yorker, I think some of the best ones um, can be very journalistic. You know, they're describing, uh, they're doing reporting and describing interviews with people and so forth, but sometimes the writing is uh, very literary and embedded with lots of ideas. There was just a fantastic piece in December by, um, I think it's a Turkish writer who wrote about a finding, a discovery in Turkey of, a, um, of what apparently is the oldest yes. big stone structure yeah. ever discovered and was built by hunter-gatherers. This might not sound like it's, it's that earth-shattering to some of you, 
but it, it actually is. It completely overturns the, um, the picture of the transition from um, Neolithic, or uh, excuse me, Paleolithic hunter-gatherer life where humans were just sort of wandering around chasing animals and so forth to the Neolithic when we invented mm -hmm. agriculture and, uh, and started settling down. Anyway, the reason I brought it up is because it's a beautiful piece of writing. Uh, lots of literary flair, lots of uh, ideas kind of sparking off in all uh, directions, but, um, but you know, it's, it's a piece of journalism at the same time. Well, but, but I can follow up on your question. I think perhaps um, what we're getting at here is that increasingly these days, um, aspects of what we might think of as traditional journalism, traditional science journalism, are in ill repute. Uh, balances bias is a great sort of uh, uh, banner cry in uh, global warming, um, uh, climate change uh, uh, catfights. Right. Um, uh, other instances, uh, uh, particularly after the Bush years, uh, where so many scientific advisory committees were politicized or whatever, there's this idea that, well, you know, um, if I just simply have a, a, a kind of ideologically driven political point that I want to make, uh, I write an essay, um, but increasingly the line between that essay and what in the old days might have been thought of as journalists is getting blurred. And it seems to me, if I may say so, you're one of the blurs. Yeah, I, I um, am. I, a lot, what I tell journal, uh, students of mine who are interested in, in journalism is that I think the whole idea of uh, objective journalism is kind of phony and, and uh, outdated and then merely in the, your choice of subject and and people to interview and facts to put into your piece, you're making all sorts of uh, subjective mm -hmm. judgments. What you're s saying just reminded me of, of um, Judith Miller, you know, the New York Times reporter who uh, helped the Bush administration make the case that, there, that Saddam Hussein was, had uh, weapons of mass destruction. And you know, if the New York Times says there are weapons of mass destruction, then Jesus, I guess we better do something about it. And, um, and then after it was exposed that there were none, and uh, Miller uh, fell into disrepute, and then Maureen Dowd had this scathing column where she said, journalism is not dictation, because Judith Miller defended herself by saying, I was just reporting on what people were telling me, that's my job. And, uh, other, and Maureen Dowd and others said, well, no, actually your job is to dig deeper and to pass, judgments on, uh, pass judgment on the things that uh, people are, are saying to you. I think, and this is a trend in science as well, um, even in uh, like fields like anthropology, I, you know, it can be done badly, sort of um, slanted, uh, uh, opinionizing uh, journalism, but I, I sort of feel like, at least in my case, it's better to be upfront about where you're coming from than to try to hide behind uh, this veil of uh, objectivity, and that's, a, that's definitely the way things are going. I, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to, to sort of teach these issues at a journalism school. Do you guys even stand up for old-fashioned reporting of the facts anymore? No. Well, yeah. <laughs> Geez, I hope so, or I'm going to have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> or it's at least important to be sophisticated in hmm, your no. approach. You know, even the sophisticated sort of in a philosophy of science sense about how truth is always constructed um, and that we should be suspicious and skeptical pretty much of any statement, especially coming from people in positions of power, whether they're Nobel Prize winners or, or secretaries of state. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay, yeah. I would just oh, add yeah. to that that uh, a fact may be objective, but the context is subjective. Right. <laughs> and that's really what that's about. I wanted to get into your uh, topic about the end of war. Uh, of course, it might be the end of the dust jacket, given it's being pared away there. Um, one of the things I noted on there, and I haven't read the book, but it noted that you there's an analogy between war and cancer. And I saw a fascinating documentary about, um, it's called Death by Design. A lot of body cells are, they're programmed to kill off old dying cells, those that are most likely to mutate and create cancerous growths. Um, wondering if you might think, or, or whether or not it's in your book, uh, that the idea is that there's a capacity for war as there is a capacity for cancer. It's just a question of whether or not 
that mechanism in us that can kill off the cancer or the, the dying cells is something where it, it's not functioning effectively and that gives rise to war. Actually, three issues, so that's one. And the other is um, it's been established that there are certain trace elements of the Neanderthal gene in at least some of us. Uh, there is, it's been hypothesized that Neanderthals are a little more peaceable. Not sure that's the case, but more so than the uh, uh, Homo sapiens. Wondering if y you sense any diversion there. And thirdly, um, my own ethos has always been that physical force is only necessary and only called for in response to physical force. Yet you have the uh, America going to war in Iraq preemptive war. The state of Israel seems to be pre premised currently on preemptive war. Where do you cross the line? How justifiable is it? So. All right. <laughs> I'll just address the, uh, the cancer analogy, cancer and war. I really tried to make that point because I, I have, um, you know, the, the sort of big idea I come up with in the book might seem silly or trivial, uh, but I, I say that war is a choice. Um, war is something that we do. It's not something that happens to us. And I, you know, I was just on this internet site called uh, Reddit. My teenage mm -hmm. son talked me into doing this thing called Ask Me Anything, and and uh, it, it was a real ride. And I said something like, you know, we can end war if we choose to. And some guy um, said, uh, you know, basically like, no shit. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and I, and so then I said, well, okay, here's what I meant by that. That um, a lot of people seem to view war, and this has come out of my discussions with people, as almost like, um, like an act of God, uh, like, a, like earthquakes or uh, severe storms, um, you know, original sin. It's, it's something that's foisted on us by our genes or by these forces beyond our control. And I'm trying to point out that, that uh, war is something that really, we really choose to do. And, um, and that makes it actually different from things like the ones I just mentioned and from something like um, uh, cancer. So cancer is something that you know, we can make more likely because of some of the things that we do, but it seems to be just a consequence of our, somehow of our uh, complex biology. And uh, nobody is saying that, well, because we haven't cured cancer yet, we should just give up. But a lot of very prominent intellectual scholars uh, do say that even to talk about the end of war is silly and naive. They have this extremely fatalistic uh, point of view uh, that I think is is um, is is terrible. It's it's uh, it's irresponsible because the fact is that that war can end tomorrow if a very small number of people around the world uh, chose to end it. The number of people who are actually waging war right now is tiny. And you know, of course, the consequences are, are, uh, are vast. But I, I'm trying to impress. So it's really a comparison to draw the distinction between things that do happen to us that we can't really control and this thing that we do that we are in control of and that we can eliminate if we have the will. You mentioned Reddit, and, uh, and I have read it. Um, and I'm curious, uh, more than many people I know uh, working uh, today, you have really, uh, as a uh, public intellectual uh, of science, you've really embraced the various social media forums and you are clearly willing to invest enormous amounts of time. This is like 29, 30, 35 pages of q and I mean, only because I printed it out. I mean, as a, as a screen scroll, it goes on for years. Um, it, but it's a, it's a huge investment of, of uh, emotional energy, of intellectual energy, uh, and it's a form of engagement, but you do that, you do the Bloggerhead's uh, web streaming uh, video exercise, you blog. What, I mean, how, 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 how do you approach these things? How do you apportion um, your attention? How do you... Um, uh, well, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not easy. I'm sure all the professional writers here are uh, you know, incredibly stressed out and, and uh, wish they had more time in the day. Um, you know, I also teach. That's my we'll real job. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Well, um, so a lot of these things, I, I did Reddit. I, you know, I'm not making any money. It was actually, as I said, my, right. son, my teenage son convinced me to do it because he thought it would be cool. I mean, he's, he hangs out on there. I did blogging heads, 
TV because my friend Robert Wright created it and he mm -hmm. asked me to do it. I said, sure, what the hell? Uh, explain to us a little bit about how that works. Um, it's, uh, you mean like technically? It's, well, I mean, what is it? It's a uh, Blogging Heads TV is uh, an internet talk show and I don't know how much longer it is for this world. Um, but uh, it's where two people, they can be anywhere, and you basically turn on your webcam, you sit in front of your uh, computer, and you talk to somebody um, anywhere else. And, and we talk for an hour, an hour, um, an hour-long video about anything. I normally talk, I talk, I've talked to a lot of different people, but um, uh, I've had a lot of conversations with this guy named George Johnson, who's a wonderful, wonderful science writer, lives in Santa Fe, and. Uh, we just, I, you know, usually I forget that I'm, t I'm recording this and I'm, I'm just shooting the shit with my friend and we talk about stuff that we read in the news. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and then it's posted and there are people actually watch it. Uh, whether or not it's, I don't know, promoting my brand or, or actually good for my, my career, I don't know. I, I do things now because I enjoy them. Um, that's a luxury I have because I have a teaching job. Mm -hmm. These are difficult times for science journalism. Uh, the money has really diminished in uh, not just real dollars in every sense. The money has diminished since I got into this business. Um, before I got this teaching job, I was worried so much about money that, that the, the fun of writing uh, was really, uh, I, I was just uh, losing any pleasure in writing. I was so worried about, you know, how am I going to you know, pay mm -hmm. my mortgage bill. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm back to, I'm having more fun than I, I have, I think, at any point in my career because I'm just doing it. You know, I write for Scientific American. They do pay me. But um, I hope that's okay to say that. Uh, okay. Um, but, you know, but, uh, but I do it because I, I, I like to do it. Reddit, Blogging Heads TV, all this other stuff. Because I feel like I, you know, I have uh, things I want to say, I want people to hear, and I want to engage with the world in, in uh, any way that I can, but, but it's actually, it happens all in a very haphazard way. Hey, John, I wanted to ask you about, uh, about the Pinker book. You, you mentioned that. Did mm -hmm. you know that it was coming, or was that like yeah. a, a happy or a sad surprise, and how did you feel about it? No, I knew. I was surprised it took him so long. And I, is there a third one, too, or am I imagining that? There's another one by uh, Joshua Goldstein right. that didn't get a lot of press, kind of got all the, you know, all the air was sucked out of the room by Pinker's gigantic book. Yeah. Um, no, I knew Pinkers was coming, and uh, I, w I, my hope was that uh, first of all, mine's really short. You can read mine in about a, you know a tenth of the time it takes to read uh, his. You know, this is a big topic. I'm hoping that instead of fratricide, you know, one book killing another, they will be kind of complementary in the way that the that wave of uh, anti-God, anti-religion books was by uh, you know, Dawkins, Dennett, and uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Um, but, and also there's some, you know, I had some real issues with uh, Pinker. I think he gets some aspects of the origins of war really badly wrong. Um, but anyway, I'm hoping there's, I think there's still some space for me out, uh, out there. But I knew, I think I knew he was working on that book going back to 2007. I, I, I think it's a useful thing to talk about because that again is a situation that we're all, we've all been in before, maybe not on this scale, not on book scale, but you know, we've all been in the position of sort of getting invested in a story and then realizing somebody else is gonna do it and maybe their, theirs is gonna hit first and then how do you deal with that and how do you react to it? I mean, did, did, did that change your mm. process in any way or did you just decide that you were gonna pretend like... At a certain happen? point, this book became a completely crazy obsession that I just had to do. It didn't matter what happened. I had so many different obstacles in my way uh, my marriage dissolved in the middle of writing it, um, and as I said, my agent thought it was terrible. And I, you know, when I were, whenever I was talking to science writer friends, they go, I could tell that you know most people thought it was a nutty idea. So the idea that there's somebody else writing a book that's uh, on sort of the same topic, it really that wasn't part of my thinking. I just had to do this. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, for those of you who are interested in in writing books, I think that. Uh, a piece of advice I often give is that if you're not obsessed with your your book idea, then it's probably a mistake to write the book, because chances are your book will flop. You won't make any money off it if it it's even published at all. Um, what, and, what do you mean? 
Well, in other words, uh, the vast majority of books vanish without a trace after they're published. Um, so if you don't do it, so if you're doing it with the expectation of some reward and you sort of look for a niche out there and you're, you, you do it in a kind of calculated way because you, know, you think that this will be good for your career, you might make some money and so forth, I think that's a mistake. I think you should really do books because uh, there's some topic that completely grips you and you can only get it out of your system by uh, writing a book. That's how I felt about every one of my books. Um, and as I, I, as I said, uh, chances are I'm always prepared for any, anything I write that no one will pay attention. And at least I had the, the pleasure, the satisfaction, although I can be excruciating too, of going through the process of exploring this thing that was really important to me and talking to other people about it and, and then trying to put it together in a, uh, in a coherent shape. So then if, if, it, uh, if the world ignores it, then you don't, you, know, you don't feel like you really wasted a couple of years of your life. So for you, book writing is an act of exorcism. I, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, and, uh, and it works, and it you know, feels good to get them, uh, to get them done. Um, you know, we haven't talked about my third book, I just wanna, which is totally different from, from the other three. The third book, Rational Mysticism, I, it was uh, going back to my, my hippie youth, and uh, you know, so I grew up in a period when a lot of us were dropping acid and chasing after gurus from the Far East and getting involved in all sorts of uh, wacky religious cults, and there was this idea that we could have these experiences mystical experiences that would uh, make us enlightened and be this kind of escape hatch in reality. And, uh, and so, you know, I'd gone far away from that as a science writer, but I decided to go back to it in this book. And um, as a result, I did a lot of, um, you know, I, I did things like uh, taking a substance called ayahuasca, uh, which is this really nasty uh, substance. It's like this tea that's made out of a couple of plants in the, uh, in the Amazon that just gets you, just like really blows your mind. And um, I took it with these people in California. It's got an active ingredient called DMT, dimethyltryptamine. It's actually really interesting. All of you have DMT in your brains right now. It's uh, the only psychedelic that is known to occur naturally in uh, the human body. I, I sought out all these gurus all over the world who said that they understood enlightenment and could talk about it from kind of rational scientific point of view. and. Um, and so I had the experience of actually trying to be, you know, I'm taking this ayahuasca stuff, it's like two in the morning and I'm hallucinating like crazy and I've got my little reporter's pad and I'm trying to <laughs> jot down notes. So that was, uh, that was really fun. I also took peyote um, with uh, Navajo on a reservation in uh, Arizona as part of this whole sort of period of research. That was paid for by Disney Corporation because I... <laughs> because I did that on, on assignment for Discover Magazine when it was owned by Disney. <laughs> so that, that was one of the real coups of my uh, career. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. again, that, you know, that probably seems uh -huh. not to have much to do with anything else that I've written, except that it was an obsession. It was something I needed to get out of my system. I had some of these uh, trip experiences floating around in my, in my head, and I needed to come to terms with those. And that's um, why so I wrote this book to, mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. So you raise a... Oh yeah, no, please uh, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I can a, hold. I can hold my thought. A comment about ayahuasca. That's like totally legal unless you're in a certain church, in, in which case it's okay, right? That's so, right. Uh, yeah, yeah you know weird. about it. so a church in uh, New Mexico led by a member of the Bronfman family who has enough money to take his quest to get this legalized as a sacrament all the way up to the Supreme Court. So yes, it is technically legal for those people. Uh, yeah, my, I had a separate question about the, the end of the war. Um, at the risk of mischaracterizing some of your uh, earlier writings, it seems like a lot of times uh, sort of your MO is um, writing about stuff that, uh, like, that's more close to ordinary r reality, or taking issue with science that seems to diverge from like ordinary reality, like alternate dimensions and stuff. And, I mean, I, I kind of dig that because I think that stuff sounds pretty crazy also, even, even though, you know, you can explain it with some equation or whatever. But in this book, which I haven't read yet, which I definitely plan to, um, uh, it seems like sort of a, an opposite, like a, an opposite um, trajectory. Like you're, you're making a statement that um, even, like you said, like the, 
um, you know, liberal hippies, whatever, like, they're like, oh yeah, you know, war's never gonna end. Um, how do you reconcile that with, uh, I mean, the way that things are? Which, I mean, you must know is your family, your, your father and grandfather were in the military, so, I mean, and you, as you say, you know, war is decided by a very few people at the very top uh, in military and intelligence. Um, and if we really want to end war, I mean, we have to, I don't know that it's like we that are going to do anything. It's these people that are going to have to stop doing something. And um, so how do you, I don't know, I mean, like, like how, do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I, uh, well, uh, let me try to respond. I, especially given, like, the, the power that, they, that uh, the military and intelligence levy on media. Like, in, in the case of Judith Miller, I mean, there's no, there's no chance she wasn't um, either w like an, a willing or unwilling asset of intelligence people who are f feeding her stuff. She was certainly doing the bidding of Dick Cheney in one way or another. Um, I'm going to answer it maybe in a way that's a little more philosophical than you like. I, I, so the, the sort of meta theme of, of this book, and actually of a, a lot of the stuff I've written over the years looking back, is um, that we have more choices than we think we do. And uh, so actually the, the last chapter in the book is about free will of all things. And my editor really wasn't sure mm. where that was going. And, you know, but by this time I was like, look, it's my book. I'm going to do it any way I want. Um, and uh, so you know, free will, what does that have to do with end of war? It, it's because um, there is all this determinism that, that is coming out of science in all these uh, different ways, coming from fields like um, uh, behavioral genetics and evolutionary psychology, which are really emphasizing the biological determinants of, uh, of uh, what we do and overemphasizing them, I think. And, and, and this isn't just wishful thinking. I think it's really that, that some of these scientists are, are overinterpreting the data because for some reason, I think our culture is just in love with determinism right now. And a lot of uh, great scientists, Stephen Hawking in his most recent bestseller has this whole passage saying that free will is obviously um, not real. Uh, Francis Crick, one of my favorite scientists, also said that. It was a real mistake on his part. Einstein, mm -hmm. I, you know, I hate to disagree with Einstein, but he got this totally wrong. He was a determinist who didn't believe in, uh, in free will either, which is ironic because, you know, he was such a great humanist. Um, so I think this is a really bad strand of thought that is emerging from uh, science right now, and part of my, even again, this might sound sort of hippy-dippy, but it's really uh, important to me. It, part of my goal in writing this book, and I, you know, I've been ranting about free will in my column for Scientific American a lot, um, mm -hmm. is that uh, this is not just a philosophical issue, it's really important. It, it has consequences, the way we think about ourselves, whether we think our, you know, we sort of have this fate that we're living out, or whether, um, Actually, we have many choices, many more choices than uh, we realize. We don't have the choices if we don't think we do. Um, you know, so we, we can actually uh, create these futures if we believe that they're possible. If, this, if we believe the scientists who are telling us that we're really fundamentally constrained in certain ways, then uh, we are not going to pursue some of these uh, options that can actually improve, um, improve our society. I don't know if that has anything. I know you're asking something more specific and political, but I think there are a lot of positive trends in the world right now. I think uh, changes in the media, like WikiLeaks, um, and even Anonymous. You know, it's it's anarchy, it's chaos, but I think it's it's frightening people in power, and I think that's always a good thing. Um, I think you know, democracy is. Fr I've also been pushing optimism on people, because optimism, I think, is related to uh, this idea of free will and, and sort of empowerment of people. I, my students are just horribly uh, pessimistic about the fate of the world, and so I've been pointing out that there are all these massive positive trends in human history over the last uh, century, especially a spread of democracy, rising affluence around the world. I mean, really, it's, it's been a um, extraordinary. Female empowerment uh, has risen tremendously over, um, over the last century. Uh, so, um, you know, I realize that people are frightened and that there are a lot of counter trends and that the United States uh, is turning into what looks like a scary national security state. But I think overall that um, there, are, there are a lot of things to be hopeful about. 
We'll see how Obama does in his second term. How, how is, <laughs> you, I, I know teaching uh, has made you feel more secure, but I wonder how being a teacher has affected your reporting and your writing. That's a good I mean, question. I noticed that this, for instance, seemed to at least, you were at least test marketing, if I can put it that way. Right. Some of your ideas in a class you were teaching on human nature and war. I don't know about the, the other teachers here, but I, I love teaching. I, you know, I'm not teaching journalism, which might be even more of an advantage. I'm, I'm, just, I'm teaching uh, students who want to be engineers or scientists, uh, doctors, and um, uh, I am constantly um, getting feedback from them that is really useful to me in my writing. Uh, I like finding out what they think, and um, I like finding out, for example, that they're so extraordinarily pessimistic about uh, the fate of the world, and they think everything is going downhill, mm -hmm. so it's, I, I try to mm -hmm. convince them, no, actually, you know, empirically, mm -hmm. a lot of things are, are mm -hmm. going in the right direction. Um, I love teaching. I haven't reached the burnout stage, maybe. Uh, you know, I've been teaching for six years now. Mm -hmm. But as an author, I'm interrupting you, and I'm sorry. Yeah. As an author, what is teaching and having that captive audience uh, is that a help? Is that a hindrance? As it's I say, great. You seem to be using it. So it's that's great. Why I'm, that's why I'm asking about it. As a science journalist, you seem to be using it. It's, um, it, for me, it's been wonderfully stimulating. I, I end up talking in my uh, column for Scientific American, mm -hmm. for example, a lot about things that my students uh, say in, uh, in class. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they're constantly feeding me. Uh, you know, I'm telling them things that I'm writing about and thinking about, and they also are giving me stuff. And, uh, it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like it's, you know, I'm being paid to do this, but it's actually mm -hmm. uh, good for the rest of my I ask because a, a number of journalists uh, and authors um, now kind of conduct their rough draft formulation process quite publicly yeah. in a way that even a few years ago would have been quite unheard of, like either because we're shy and nervous as writers and we don't want anybody looking at what we're doing until we've convinced ourselves it's perfect or we don't want anybody stealing our ideas. We, want to maintain priority, but it seems to me that like you in your classroom or one of the things we'll be talking to uh, Annie Murphy Paul about in a couple of weeks is, you know, she's working on a book right now and she's, she's kind of popping chapters out in her blog and getting feedback. Really? Chris Mooney uh, worked out, I think, a lot of his uh, uh, material for Republican War on Science that way. And I just wonder, do you kind of cross both divides here? Yeah. I. I you know, I, I definitely am floating some ideas out there in, um, in my blog, for example, some of these other uh, places that I, I write for. Again, I think it's part of what's exciting about science journalism right now. It's just, it's evolving so rapidly in so many different ways. And, um, you know, so I, I see, and you're, you're telling me about people are sort of experimenting with the possibilities of even, I don't know, collaborative journalism or uh, certainly just getting feedback before publication. I still know some journalists. I have one friend, very accomplished, who this would all be anathema to him. He, he's, you know, incredibly secretive, paranoid about people ripping off his ideas. I think there still are a lot of writers out there like that, uh, maybe for good reason. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's kind of exciting mm -hmm. that you have the, the potential to try all these other things out. How do you do it but maintain priority? Priority over, over, your, over your thing, over your idea, over your line of inquiry, over your shtick. I mean, yeah. um, oh, you know, uh, I see John on Reddit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip. That's great. I'm taking that straight to Discover before he gets <laughs> off the screen. You know, um, I don't know. I haven't really been. I think one of the advantages of being, I, I don't know, so eccentric or idiosyncratic is is that I've never really worried about people ripping off my shtick because it's, it's kind of most people. Well, I, most I didn't of my mean to be disrespectful. No, no, no. Yeah. I get it. No, yeah. I, no, like for end of science uh, again or end of war, it wouldn't be like people are going to rush out. Most people's reaction was, "You're crazy. That's that's a stupid idea. Why would it? You know, why would you even bother writing this book?" Um, so I don't think I have. You know, I know the, I know other writers who are on topics, and they do get ripped off. Um, or beaten to the punch. I, you know, I guess maybe you could say that that happened to me with uh, Steve Pinker's book. I don't really think of it in those terms. Um, so, uh, you know, there's so What happens when they get beaten to the punch? What are you talking about? Well, I know, for example, um, I have a friend, uh, Andy Repkin, you know, wonderful environmental writer. He wrote a book on Cesar Chavez, uh, the uh, person who was trying to 
organize rainforest laborers, I think it was. Susan Chavez is, a, oh, yeah. is a farm workers in California. Who's the other, who's the guy? Chico Mendez. Chico Mendez. Sorry. Yeah. Um, anyway, Andy wrote this book and then he found out that there was another guy doing exactly the same, a biography of this guy who was murdered tragically, mm -hmm. it was a you know, very dramatic story. And then they were, you know, both had big publishers and the books came out and they got joint reviews and, and I know Andy was, you know, was upset uh, by that. So it does, it does, um, it does happen and it can, in, in that case, I think you do get fratricide where one would, where it's a zero sum game. Uh, but then, um, you know, I think you can deliberately find topics where that wouldn't be a problem. And that, that's kind of what I've tried to do. What's your next contrarian take on reality? I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of resting. Uh, I'm, you know, this was, this book exhausted me even though it's tiny. It was, uh, it was really a lot of effort to, uh, to get this one done. Um, I haven't, I, all my other books, before, I even, before they were even published, I knew what I was going to do next and had already been consumed by something that I had to do. Um, and that hasn't happened. I, right. I, I, don't, I don't know what I can do after the end well, of Well, they war. say to do that, I mean, agents and publishers and editors tell you to do that to protect against the big emptiness, you know? I mean, the, <laughs> right. the void, you know? I'm not feeling the, the void right now. I'm yeah? feeling uh, relief. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I wanna, I wanna add to your relief by, by we, we've been picking your brain now here for almost two hours. And uh, I, I really appreciate your, your openness and your frankness about what you do. And uh, it, it's um, fascinating, both the product but the process by which you approach it. And I, I just thank you for sharing it with us this evening. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Lou. That's great. I'll yeah, just I'll just show for John one more time and say that if you want the uh, the uh, on ramp straight into John's brain, uh, 1995 <laughs> uh, over there on the table. I'm I'm looking forward to reading it. John always has something interesting to say, and uh, that's pretty much the highest praise you can give to a writer. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate yeah. it. And thanks for coming, folks. Thank you again. And I see some science writer friends out there. David? Yeah. You know David Barabee? Oh.